Hi, and welcome to Rule of Carnage. I'm Glenn Ford, and I'm here talking to Mike Hutchinson about Hi. designing better miniatures games. Um, so today we, uh, well, Mike got a, a tweet um, suggesting a, a subject that I think is will fit quite neatly into the, the, the run of videos at the moment. Mike, do you want to read the tweet out and we'll start talking? Yeah, so Trials of a Casual Wargamer said, random question. When designing a game, do you go with mechanics first or the setting and fluff? Um, what an interesting question. Yes, yeah. So I think we're going to uh, try and talk a bit about theme today, theme in relation to games, uh, miniature games, war games. I think, first of all, what might be interesting is take maybe uh, a little bit at the start of the video talking about... So we, we often refer to theme as being um, the, 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 the background, the story to a particular game. And it's a slightly odd word to, to use, really. Because, I mean, if, if, if you take a, a movie, um, when, they, when a movie has a certain theme, they're not talking about where it's set or, or the plot or the character. It's talking about something much more overarching. Um, about the film and, and that's the same for for books for for most sorts of media um when we say the theme for a miniature game it's quite odd that we we mean something a little bit more i don't know uh crunchy a little bit more prosaic well, I, th but... I think i think weirdly in tabletop gaming the word theme has got mixed up with the word genre mm -hmm. um which itself is a somewhat problematic word but we probably won't use the word genre very much in the following conversation, but um, that's definitely one of the places that the terminology get, gets mixed up. And I guess that I also want to introduce a couple of other, I want to make sure that we're talking about a couple of other things separately, because um, I think that the, the idea that underpins the game, which I think is probably closest to the theme when you're talking about a book or a movie, like what is that? piece of fiction about what it is what is it trying to say or what's it trying to examine that is different to the sort of the theme as in what sort of a world does it take place in and that's I think also different from the setting which is much more specific which is like what's the specific universe that this exists in um, so I think setting and theme and what I would call the idea uh, to borrow a term from um, from David Lynch, uh, those are all separately examinable. Yes, do, do, definitely got to do a Lynchian miniatures game at some point. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think there's yeah, there's certainly there's a line between um, the theme, the setting, the plot. Um, it, it, the tweet you just read out there, there's a, a little term that not everybody might uh, be super familiar with, fluff. Uh, in relation to, to gaming. For, for those who haven't heard of that before, the fluff is the, the flavor text, the story attached to the game that maybe doesn't have a, a rules waiting or a rules purpose, but tells you a bit about the universe you're in. Um, if, uh, if, if, you, if you're familiar with a magic card, the little bit in italics at the bottom, that would be the fluff. See, I, um, I've... I've noticed that people have gone off the term fluff because there's one meaning of that word which makes it feels like it's insubstantial and it's mm. it's it doesn't mean anything or it's not important. But the sort of other use of fluff is to stuff a teddy bear. And in a way, <laughs> I've always thought of this of the of the word fluff as the thing that pads it out, the thing that creates the volume around not just the pure interlocking crunchy mechanics but like what does the rest of it feel like when you when you squish it what does it feel like um so i don't mind the word fluff uh, just to take a little just take a little stand on that word yeah no i mean i've i i i uh, it is annoying when people use fluff as a sort of pejorative um i definitely when it's uh, particularly um when you're just playing competitive war games and somebody says oh don't worry this is a fluffy list this is it's a, that's your excuse for why your army sucks is that you didn't write it to be competitive you instead wrote it to some sort of extra set of rules that aren't officially part of the system wherein you've you've put unnecessary constraints on yourself because yeah some oh, internal some internal narrative consistency is more important than some you know, optimization of the rule system 
yeah um so yeah in relation again sort of to that tweet um so do you personally have uh, an actual system in your process where where theme comes before mechanics or mechanics comes before theme is there a difference of of importance for you personally i i I've, I've thought about it a bit since receiving this tweet and i think obviously the answer is it, it depends a bit and, and i've done things in a number of orders but i think there is generally in in my process there's a sort of hierarchy here where um the thing that gets me going is the idea and the idea can come from a bunch of different places and it can be of a different character depending on 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 what is what is what is getting me excited but the the idea is the initial feeling that gets me excited and in some cases in a few cases i want to say that in some cases it comes from a an interesting idea of what a mechanical interaction might be but i think in reality, that's probably not true. I'm not sure I've ever started with a mechanic. I think I've always started with a, a feeling or an image or a, an excitement about something which I've maybe pulled from a movie, maybe pulled from a book, maybe pulled from a miniature that's sitting, you know, gathering dust, maybe just sort of from a computer game or from a genre trope that I maybe haven't seen explored well enough. And then that becomes like the central sort of spark of something that will go on to define the theme, uh, although not necessarily the setting. will go on to define the theme, but itself isn't necessarily describing that. And then I'll put the first onion skin of mechanics around that idea to try and capture it, to try and bring it into the world. So with Perilous Tales, for example, I had an idea that I, I had these Cthuloid miniatures from the Cthulhu Wars box set, and I had some um, I think I maybe had some investigators from from uh, maybe Mansions of Madness, and I looked at them and I want and I sort of said, "There's a horror movie that needs to emerge on the table, and I don't know how it works." And that was enough. That was the idea. And once I caught a flavor of that, I was like, "Okay, now I'm going to wrap it in some initial mechanics, and they might not work." Um, and that sort of suggested, okay, the theme is maybe Lovecraftian. But as that game system developed, it actually became clear that what I initially thought was a Lovecraftian game sort of developed into something that was much more of a classic hammer horror thing. And at one point, um, Glenn, you, you read the rules in a sort of uh, embryonic state and said, it's weird that you've got these Lovecraftian beasties in because there isn't any mechanical flavoring that would you would tend to find for a Lovecraftian thing. And you sort of said, this isn't Lovecraft, this is horror. And I <laughs> went, no, it, damn it, it started with Lovecraft miniatures. It is Lovecraft. Um, but that was like, that's where the theme began to emerge. It's like, oh, okay, the theme is that of horror movies, which again is a strong genre. And really when we say theme here, we mean genre. Um, mm. uh, yeah, and then not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but to sort of signpost a later part of the conversation. I had a really transformational experience on both Gaslands and A Billion Suns, where the game theme had been described really nicely by the rules, but it wasn't ticking as a whole yet, and it wasn't sort of selling itself in its complete form. And so I stopped working on the rules and I started thinking about the setting. And in both cases, um, I used sort of imagination and role playing as a way of exploring that. And once I had the setting, like what is the what is the players in the universe? What are the characters? What's the the nation states? Like what is this what what are the internal logics that this world functions on? That then fed back into the rules mechanics and um, began to strengthen the theme by bringing it to life and surrounding it with that lovely fluff that made it uh, larger and, um, and and more squeezy. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I think there's a couple of uh, points that I think it'd be great to sort of uh, maybe we'll circle back round to in a minute. Is like you say the the point in Perilous Tales where you you went from saying okay this is a Lovecraft game, and I looked at it and I said okay well there are certain things you that that Lovecraft says it says that there will be a sanity mechanic and there will be a massive elder god that that comes in at some point and there will be various things that work in certain ways and your mechanics are not lovecraft mechanics they're 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 pulp horror 
um, you know, adventure fiction mechanics, but they're just not Lovecraft mechanics. And we can make it a Lovecraft game or we can not, but... There may be Robert E. Howard's, lo- like, m- m- mythos. Yeah, yeah, no, no, t- yes, absolutely. Wandering into a jungle and finding a giant Lovecraftian beastie and then waving a sword at it. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, to a degree. And, and there, you know, we, we can do it, and, you know, because... It f- I, I don't know what form um, Perilous Tales end up being in when it gets seen by the general public, but there was a lot of Lovecraft scenarios in there and Lovecraft beasties. And I think we've been sort of realizing that, yeah, it goes maybe going a bit more towards that hammer horror universal sort of horror end of things. So I think it's an interesting conversation to be had about realizing that the theme and the mechanics is something other than you thought they were when you are the creator of the entire universe and and it should all be what you said it was because you are the Lord High um, progenitor of the entire project. Um, I think yeah, I that's, think that's games being disobedient children <laughs> and not doing what you tell them to do. And I that's sort of I like a lot of things about the game design process. That might be one of my favorite things is when you 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 you're chiseling away and you knock a bit off and it wasn't the bit that you expected and it splinters off in a weird way and you're like oh wow this game is actually something slightly different to what i expected um Mm. and i can either go back and go no no this is a dead end i don't or it's it's not the place i want to go and then come back to your idea and your initial mechanics and try and work it again um but in most cases i've sort of gone oh that was something i didn't think of let's let's hammer further in that direction and see where we get to yeah, and I think we should definitely at some point talk about your process of um, creating little role-playing game worlds in which to investigate the fluff for your your tabletop miniatures games. So, um, let's, so let's let's flip the question around. So, so Glenn, do you sit down and do you go, okay, fresh bits of paper? It's a cowboy game. Hmm. Yeah. I, okay. Yes. So I was I was thinking about this obviously leading up to this video and. F- for me, game design is, it's fundamental, it's an intellectual process, it's a, 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 a sort of creative process, but it starts with a sort of a question. Uh, and what I find is that if it starts with the setting, it's a setting that, that asks a question like, can I make a convincing pirate game? cowboy game a game that that has all the familiar elements of a tabletop miniatures game but is definitely a pirate game and if i took the theme off of it you would still look at what was happening and go i'm pretty sure they're pirates and they're on a boat or i'm pretty certain that that's a, a cowboy showdown um whereas if i start with a mechanic it i've got the answer to a question and then i've got to figure out what the what the question was that that mechanic is an answer to where it's like oh this 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 mechanic is is particularly beautiful it's very jewel like it's it's splendid and it's doing something that's inherently interesting and fun now i have to find out what that mechanic what question that mechanic is the answer to and so sometimes yeah so some it, it just depends what the what the grabbing thing is i mean i I know I don't like to write things. If I if I think of a thing and there's a question and I just know the question immediate the answer immediately, it's like, oh, could I write a game like that? Yeah, I'm pretty certain I could write a game that does X. Fine, I don't need I won't need to do that then. I, I, it's why I'm not a fan of the, of games that. Um, and in relation to theme and mechanics, it's I say where where there's a game, I've got a uh, one of my blogs is a set of generic um skirmish game rules where you can literally um pick and choose and you'll have a perfectly good skirmish game and that'll do the framework for you so if your game is just that please don't write it take that take that framework and then do something else so that when i pull the theme off and then look at what's underneath i don't just go well this could be this could be any game in the world and if if the game in question is any game in the world i know for certain i can write that i you know we we've all sort of written those at various points you know throughout our lives and we've certainly seen 101 of them um i need to have a a setting where i go i don't know i don't know if i could make you know horror work properly i don't know if i could write my version of a lovecraft game i do you know i i don't know all can i make a pirate game in with, with a dynamic um environment and then if that question is interesting, 
and I can write a set, uh, and I said about writing a set of mechanics that definitively are part of the theme in question. That's that's more how I, the way I go um, about putting them together. Mm. Um, there's there's nothing more tragic than than a game where you feel like if I if I if I hadn't read the theme, I wouldn't know what world this was meant to be set in. Yeah, I think I think that, and I don't know that that is true for so i think there's a world where that isn't true where you have a product line maybe a set of miniatures and a toy soldiers and that is part of evoking the entire experience of the game and i think that 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 is almost as true of like it's certainly true of like games workshop where everything like the whole product line is is just you know evoking this whole thing and that the you know the mechanics of the game are there to 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 to, to engender enjoyment with the toy soldiers but for mm. certainly for the kind of um independent of miniature lines games that we tend to write like the game has to be about something it has to be mechanically about something that alchemy that i've talked about before where you take some mechanics and through their interlockingness and through being processed by the the human computer that's the the player like that interpretation creates a feeling in people's mind and that feeling absolutely has to be that i'm being chased by zombies or that you know there's a there's a uh, regency era duel going on and that nothing else could be true of that alchemy because mm. that's what that alchemy is trying to create um I, and i i think I, I i strongly agree like it, it's it, it's this is probably true even of those games where you've got big product lines but i strongly agree that like general purpose systems I, I get very i get very disheartened when i see a sort of rules engine the word rules engine is sort of an anathema to everything that i believe about tabletop games design because if you've built a rules engine then it's probably not doing anything it's probably just doing enough to cover the basics and whatever you whatever you are trying to evoke with that alchemy is like it's got to be about something it's got to be the the pirate thing that locks together or it's got to be the the spaceship thing that locks together and if you just take the same set of resolution mechanics and try and put that onto any theme then you aren't really exploring the theme mechanically you're not doing the thing that is unique about tabletop games yeah no totally if there, if, yeah if, if if there's if there's a rule and the reason that the rule has a theme is that it's called a certain thing then that's that's not what I mean by by theme. I, yeah, know. that's a good example. Although although actually, as we get into into setting, that becomes that becomes an important tool, but I don't think it's a foundational one. I think it's quite a third order one. Yeah, yeah, but it shouldn't it shouldn't be a case of well, you know, how do you know that this is the the, the running rule? Well, it's called running, so there we go. That's how you know it's called. It, it's the running rule. Well, does it feel like running? Do things get exhausted? Do they move in the right way? And um, I think one of the things that one of the reasons I think that it's quite important to have these these two things meshing together, and it's something that I particularly love about Gaslands, is when you're playing and somebody asks, "Can I do X?" And you can say, "Yeah, of course you, of course you can." We totally have that covered, because theme. I, I think theme is, is best as a lot of things. But one of the things it does that's really handy is that it it it, give, it teaches the game for you very quickly um, if it's if it's done well. Because you say, "Okay, you're in this sort of world. You're you're this sort of person," and they go, "Right, well, if I'm in that sort of world and I'm that sort of person, I'll be able to do X, Y, and Z, right?" I and think. I think one of the ways, one of the ways, and I, I maybe maybe this is something to worry about with a with a particular design to address this, but maybe like one of the ways that it does that is that a good games design will will be aware of its genres tropes, and so the theme can be expressed as a series of tropes. Like when I hit a building, like when I hit a ramp, do I flip onto my roof and skid? Like when I skid to a halt, damage, do I explode? Well, all of these things are true in Hollywood movies, ergo they are true in Gaslands. And when you ask the question, does the cinematic trope happen? The answer should, you know, certainly for a cartoonish game like Gaslands be yes. Um, 
you know, when I'm fighting, when I'm fighting on board a pirate ship, are there waves and is the pirate ship rocking? Yes, those tropes yeah. have to be true, or this isn't going to be successful as, as a design. Because otherwise, yeah. you get those cognitive dissonances where a player goes, can I do the obvious thing that I would want to do in this situation? You go, no, no, we don't have rule systems for, you know, jumping, jumping down from your horse after it's been killed. Yeah. No, totally. It, it's like, yeah, if you tell me that there's a certain theme, I want to be able to do the things that the theme makes me think I should be able to do. Otherwise, why did you tell me that there was that theme? You're just you're just confusing me unnecessarily. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you've got you're a you're a gunfighter. All right. So quick drawing. No, there, there aren't rules for quick drawing. <laughs> well, then why did you tell me I was a gunfighter? I'm clearly not. I'm clearly just a dude with a gun. That's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think you have to sort of pay out your 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 theme for people. Although a good theme, I think, makes the game easier to learn, and I think a bad theme makes it significantly harder to learn. So 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 here's here's the here's the here's the rub on that one though, which is let's say that we have a very strong idea about what our fictional setting is, and that that fictional setting is quite unusual and. Uh, let's not say original because I'm not sure that even exists but if we're trying to tell a different if we're trying to evoke a different kind of universe like something that's got some mashing, mashings up of other things or something that's you know striving to be very uh, intriguing and new then I suppose that you, you you need to use the theme but you've got a lot of work to do to communicate that because when people approach that they're like what's the I'm not sure what the tropes are here because this is unfamiliar for me so i don't know what it's supposed to do i'm tr i'm trying to think of a game that's truly original in that way and i'm struggling a little bit yeah and i, th I think that's uh that, that's what I'd, I'd like to get on to chatting about in the in the second half of uh of this conversation is to um why some themes are so popular and come up so repeatedly and why some never get get touched i think for for a minute within this uh this part of the conversation i'd love to come back to um telling people uh, going back to the thing you 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 were saying about how you investigated the theme on a billion suns and gaslands via um uh, uh, sort of creating a whole world beyond the, the the more simple set of mechanics i know particularly for gaslands there is a uh, a, a, a set of rules somewhere out there in the world for role playing in the Gaslands universe for various reasons. But um, do you want to talk a bit about why? Because to my mind, you put in, I know there were various reasons why you put in so much work, but you put in a lot of work to, to, to building a set of fluff that, you know, I love Gaslands. It's, it's great. And it, it's a whole universe, but it doesn't. It 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 it's not Tolstoy. You didn't need it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's background is is not you know the, the great American novel. It didn't need the amount of weight you put into it. Do you want to talk a bit about why you did that? What the motivation was? How it helped you? Yeah. So I think th this is the boundary I, thank line. God the answer there was yes. <laughs> For a minute, I thought you were going to go. No, <laughs> not really. All right, fine, fair enough. <laughs> Sorry, this, no, this is no. this is the borderline between what I think of as theme and what I think of as setting, um, and the theme on the theme on both games. So I got to the edge of what I could achieve with pure genre tropes. So in Gaslands, you know, I prepared m my body by watching you know all of the mad max films and you know the modern death race movies and like uh you know and running man and you know just consumed a, and and fast and the furious which uh, i regret and i just consumed a load of, <laughs> consumed a load of exploding media in order that as i pushed the toy cars around i could i could sort of experience what the feeling was I was trying to evoke and then I could describe it with mechanics and when those mechanics didn't do explodey enough things I would change them to be more explodey but then I got to the outer edge of like I couldn't quite finish the game the game was was fine and it was ticking but it wasn't singing yet and what I realized was I needed to know a bit more about how the universe within which this game was functioning uh, operated so that I could begin to put use that intel to go back in and um, and I think also to sort of wrap my description of the rule system in something that was bigger than just the rule system and it wasn't just a collection of tropes. Um, so what I did was um, 
convinced uh, convinced a few of my uh, creative confidants, uh, John and uh, John Brindley and Rufus, uh, who we game with regularly, were we were we were role playing a lot at that time, and we were bouncing around playing all kinds of different systems. And I just said, "Hey, I'm sort of I think jo John and I were were having an extended conversation about what this world, how it functioned, because I think we were talking about scenarios at the time, and scenarios I think is one of the ways that that this hooks in." And we just hit on the idea of like, why don't we just go and explore this place at ground level? Why don't we go and look at it with our own eyes? So we just grabbed any old rule system. I think we used Savage Worlds. And I just like, it forced me as a sort of GM to go away and write enough of a role-playing rule book, you know, only like sort of four pages or something of bullet points to be like, okay, so if I was gonna set an adventure in the Gaslands universe, like where would it be? And I wrote down like five or six different kind of countries that it could be on. And I'd been to Japan recently and I'd seen um, the sort of giant, um, uh, railway stations of Tokyo and I thought okay let's like what if that had decayed but it wasn't completely decayed and it wasn't like it wasn't like um you know properly post-apocalyptic but it was just like you know really decayed from where it was and maybe re really depopulated and so kind of got down at the ground level and started to explore it and that allowed me to sort of taste and feel what the sort of what the behaviors of those people were like what they cared about like how come there's television when there isn't the internet and like is there electricity there must be electricity because there's television okay like how do i resolve all of this sort of I, i've plugged a bunch of tropes together but they haven't resolved themselves in any internal um consistent narrative so forcing my face to the grill the red hot grill of narrative consistency <laughs> like at a ground level made me have to consider those things and a lot of those things end up not necessarily mattering but what they allowed me to do is to go back and write the scenarios and go back and write the sponsors and go back and write the um you know write some of the names of the rules and so on and be able to be confident that like well this is what happens in this universe because i've explored it and i've seen it at ground level and this is and then it allowed me to start playing with that and make jokes that were working for myself because i sort of like you know we we played a we played a, a one scenario where it was like a one shot scenario where um, you're in a you were, the, the players were in a helicopter and they crashed into an island. And as they crashed, they realized that the pilot was fake and three of the people that had died in the crash were like camera crew members that weren't actually, you know, contestants or something. Um, and so then sort of then a sort of Jurassic Park thing spiraled out of control and at the end they were inside a hollow mountain like wondering why there was a hollow mountain and then a sort of Martian um, airship sort of interceptor thing rose up and so by doing all of by jamming all of that stuff together and exploring at a ground level I sort of got the sense of like oh okay so there's maybe there's there's underground cells of earth terrorism and there's there's hidden caches of Martian sort of stuff from the war but actually there's lots of like fake television shows and that just gave me all of this raw material to start working with and what was initially just a set of tropes that allowed the rules to to fit together became like uh, you know just a fertile playground for me to like plant new ideas and I knew roughly how they fitted together and then Fantastic. the same was this because of that experience I knew that this the same ended up being true for a billion sons but it was sort of more deliberate the second time around and on a billion sons um the idea was uh, I've talked about it before, but it was like that spaceship appearing from nowhere with other spaceships yeah. platting off it. And I didn't know for ages whether the theme was, um, I didn't know whether the, the game was about big fleet battles or whether it was about something else. And um, the, uh, the game reached a point where it had a bunch of interesting mechanics, a lot of tropes and sort of high concept ideas that weren't gelling together and at that point I sort of remembered what had happened when I hit that point in Gaslands and I said great I'm going to put the whole mechanics away for two months and I'm just going to think about the setting and I'm just going to write sort of fiction about it and I'm just going to explore it at the ground level um, in our role-playing group and that allowed me to with quite a lot of help from Rufus actually who who got really into the idea of the sort of uh, the setting and so I, I and I also consumed a lot of books at that point I was like okay yeah. I, I read a bunch of like military sci-fi to try and get like a bunch of flavors of like how people have described space combat and what it sort of felt like to be in those sort of 
environments and i thought no no let me put all of that away and i want to read a bunch of stuff that's about um the economics and the society and the um and the problems of ai and robots and i wanted to get all of that crammed into my head so that as i sat down to explore like how does this universe fit together that it became a you know something that was still very pony and like you know i'm not going to write a 12 novel series that's you know out of this background that's incredibly rich but it was enough for me to have a fertile sort of playground to plant seeds and ideas and then particularly with a billion sons although this happened with gas hands as well once i had the central conceit and the gags that made the world funny to me then i could put all of that back into the names of the rules and suddenly things that were called tactical points were now called credits and instead of like running out of tactical points you went into debt and now like the the, the, the setting now described why the rule system uh, existed in the way that it did in a way that it just like then it became easy to get to the next stage of the game because um uh because of that logical consistency that narrative consistency for 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 the reference of people watching at home mike has horrifying gaps in his pop culture movie knowledge i think it was like two weeks ago you texted us to say that you'd watch demolition man for the first time in your life yeah weird i don't know <laughs> how i missed that <laughs> what, that was, what the hell's that about um, actually i'm pretty sure i know why because i haven't seen universal soldier and i thought they were the same movie why haven't you seen universal soldier i don't know I'll, just, I'll get on that yeah it's 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 genuinely bizarre and upsetting how how little 90s dystopian future <laughs> schlock you've seen it don't worry i've got one absolute corker that um you're going to be shocked and appalled to find out that it's only just now on my nightstand about to be read okay I, i'm not I'm... going to reveal it in public it's too embarrassing <laughs> okay fair enough okay so with that we'll, we'll sign off from this video um where have you found this there'll be a comment section let us know what you think and what you'd like to talk about in the future just like um, with this video we'll try and pick up any tweets anything people ask about if you're watching this video it is available as a podcast podcast for long painting sessions uh if you're on the podcast check us out on uh, youtube and reach out to us on twitter any social media uh, but until next time it's goodbye for now bye, bye.